the more fat something has, the more toxins it accumulates. It, or just it's a storage house for those things. So you have to be careful because if you're going to add a, eat a fatty cut like a uh, ribeye, which can be delicious, if you're having that ribeye at a restaurant, be careful. So what are the top toxins keeping us from getting well, losing weight, and feeling alive? Yes, yeah, so when I started talking about this topic of toxins, it wasn't that big a thing 10, 12 years ago. But the statistics have always been there. So when we look at just something like mercury in the environment, <clears throat> we know that mercury is a heavy metal. It's dangerous for the nervous system. It could play a role in dementia or Alzheimer's. But a lot of people don't know that for every thousand pounds of mercury uh, put out into the environment, autism has gone up by 63%. So that's a direct correlation actually by the University of Texas. And then when we look at the 99% of all people tested, this is from the FDA, have some level of DDT in their blood. Keep in mind that DDT has not been allowed to be sprayed for over 50 years. Mm. So these are things that we want to bring up. We don't want to be, I don't like to do fear mongering, but we have to be aware so that we can say, okay, if there's two ways in which people become sick and unwell and actually put on weight, it's deficiencies or toxicities. I think we're really good at talking about deficiencies, right? So if there's methylation issues, well, what do we need? Okay, folate, B12, B6, trimethylglycine. Uh, if we need omega-3s, we know where to look there. But very few times are we talking about what needs to be eliminated from the body. And when I wrote my book, this is five years ago now, there were about 77,000 man-made chemicals in the environment. There's now over 120,000. Wow. In Europe, there was 8,000. Now there's a little over 12,000. So there's still a huge discrepancy, but no matter where you are in the world, these heavy metals and just parabens, um, benzenes, all sorts of things are continuing to accumulate. Forever chemicals and the like and things like that, among, a um, among many others. Yes, the forever chemicals are an interesting one because they're showing up in our food, they're showing up in our soil, they're showing up in our water. And so very difficult to eliminate those. But the thing is, again, no fear mongering, if we are always working at detoxing our body, and again, that was, you couldn't even say that word 15 years ago, but now you can, because what do we have? Saunas, we have functional medicine detoxes. We're aware that we're trying to eliminate as much as we're trying to take in. Hmm. Critics and, and skeptics of this idea that we need to be, that we all need to be more mindful of, of environmental toxicity will say, well, we'll say that, you know, detoxing is something that your, your own liver does naturally. Yes. Like, you know, there, there, there are a lot, you get a lot of pushback sometimes on social media today to this notion of detoxing. So how do you kind of contextualize it in a way that is um, actionable for people, but also kind of physiologically uh, accurate, I suppose you could for say. For sure. And I actually think it's fair pushback because not everything is a detox, right? You don't have like, we have detox cookies now, we've got detox teas, we've got, so it's fair pushback from critics. But really what we're talking about is that our liver moves through phase one, phase two detoxification. And I'm sure you've talked about that on the show maybe before, but our body does that. If it wasn't doing that, we would literally, our kidneys would shut down. So first our liver, but essentially what the liver does is it pre-filters the blood for the kidneys. And that's really important because if not, you go into sepsis and then you're going to die. You're going to die actually pretty quickly. And a lot of older people actually die from sepsis. And that's not the main cause of death that they put on that, but their body can no longer filter their blood. Now for us, everyday average individual, yes, everything that we take in, whether it's chlorine vapors from a shower or chlorine or fluoride from water, we're taking these things in. If they started to accumulate in our body, they would absolutely kill us. So our liver does break these down first into what from a fat soluble toxin to a water soluble toxin. And and then we eliminate it in one of four ways. We eliminate it from the bile into the stool, from the basically liquid into urine, and then we're looking at sweat and we're looking at huffing it off through our lungs. That is how we keep the body safe and healthy. We can go into phase one, phase two if you want, but what happens is this, is that we know, and some of the biggest skeptics out there have tested their blood. The One of the best studies out there was something called 10 Americans. 10 Americans is a great study by the Environmental Working Group. And this was just done about 30 years ago or so. So they tested these 10 individuals on 400 toxins that are in the environment. What they found is that these 10 people on average had about 236. So wow. when they broke that down and they looked at that, they say, okay, we only tested 400 of the 100,000 or so chemicals. 236 came up, but yet these individuals weren't even born yet. So this was done on the fetal cord blood from the placenta to the child. This was a famous study that has now been repeated multiple times. And again, like I said, some of the greatest skeptics have gone, had their blood taken and actually still seen chemicals in their blood. One of the things I like to share is that 
um, if you follow sports and you follow wrestling or UFC or anything like that where there's weight cuts, you'll often see them test positive for drugs they may have taken, but it was five years ago, 10 years ago or more. And the reason is that our adipose tissue, as well as our brain, is really good at storing these chemicals and pulling them out of our blood because our liver can't take everything. And so what happens is when you cut that last five pounds or 10 pounds that you've never lost before, these chemicals in your fat, your adipose tissue is about 300 times more toxic than the blood. It dumps these into the blood. And now what happens is, and this is clinically proven, the body can go through Herxheimer-based reactions because the liver at that moment isn't able to conjugate all of these things and remove them from the body. Wow. And then it's, they show up. It's essentially like the liver gets overloaded. That's right. And so all our job is during a functional medicine detox is to simply support the liver. We're not telling the liver what to do. We support it with phase one nutrients, which are essentially all your methylated B vitamins. So we usually think about vitamin B9, which is methylfolate, B12, methylcobalamin, but it's actually B6, it's riboflavin, it's um, zinc and copper. There's actually, there's a very fascinating phase because when your body takes these fat soluble toxins, so let's just say you're someone that's, you wanna lose 10 pounds, 20 pounds, 30 pounds. Okay, so you're liberating all these chemicals now from your fat tissue. It goes into your bloodstream, it has to be broken down by the liver quickly so it doesn't create massive free radical damage, start to destroy the mitochondria, pass the blood-brain barrier. So what happens is it uses those vitamins and it creates what's called an intermediary metabolite. This is essentially a free radical. And if you don't conjugate that and you remove it from the body through glucuronidation and other processes, it is actually more harmful than if you didn't break it down in phase one in the first place. Because mm. you have this intermediate metabolite that is essentially a massive free radical. Mm. And so your body's producing glutathione, it's using N-acetylcysteine, it's using taurine, it's using methionine to then take this intermediate metabolite, turn it into a water-soluble toxin, which can now very easily be moved out of the body. Wow. So I definitely want to go deeper into your protocol for helping the body assist the body's own endogenous detoxification pathways. But among the hundreds of thousands of now man-made chemicals that are pervasive in the environment, how do you then, like, what is your approach to, um, to reducing exposure, right? Like, cause you can't, you also can't drive yourself crazy. That's right. So what do you do? Like, what are the most, I guess, the most concerning ones to you? And yeah, let's start there. So in our practice, I've been practicing now for a little over 20 years. In the beginning, I used to have these massive booklets that people would leave with. They'd be like 30 pages long, say, here's your nutrition plan. It's the de-stress protocols, so your diet, exercise, stress reduction, toxin removal, rest, emotional balance, scientifically backed supplements, and like the success mindset not to fall back. Mm. But it was too much. It was overwhelming. So we said, okay, well, what do we do? We start from the basis. So we know that everybody... Every nutrition plan is slightly different based on the individual. And we can add home lab tests. We can actually see that what the deficiencies are. We can see the toxicities. But we want to set the stage. So we do a 7, 14, or 21-day detox. And really, it was novel 15 years ago. It's not as novel now. Because what are we doing? Okay, we're including intermittent fasting. We're creating, we're creating two days, which is essentially shake fast. So it's liquid, but it's almost no macros. It's all micronutrients. Hmm. And that's just supporting the body's detoxification. It, it runs into the third day. So you're getting what is about 72 hours. And it's funny because in 2016, they started to really look at autophagy. Obviously, that's the year that it won the Nobel Prize in, in oncology for autophagy. And what they found was that it was about the three-day point where you started to max out on results. Oh, wow. And so... As practitioners, we were saying this is where we're seeing the results. We don't always know why until the research essentially catches up, but a lot of times you see that in practice. So we'll move from a foundational protocol like the detox, days three through seven. It's essentially um, plant-based until dinner, and then dinner's a paleo-style meal. And it's not that we don't believe in eating meat and fish and those types of things. It's just now, again, research just over the last year has shown that if you continue on just plant-based foods, so you're not getting as much of the leucine, isoleucine, valine, you actually stay in more of an autophagy-based state, even when fed. And the reason is that you're not increasing mTOR as much, and AMPK is staying a little bit higher. So that was fascinating. So again, all, it was only based on what we were seeing in practice. And then of course the body, you don't want to become too catabolic. So then having some fish or some meat um, can be very healthy for you. So that's how we set the stage. And then it's based on individual protocol. And what we want, just getting back to the toxins, if you can, we want to work on three things, clean food, clean air, and clean water. Mm -hmm. And that's basically it. That's how we start. So good quality air filter, you're done. If you can only get one for your home, you put it in your bedroom an hour before bed, and then you have it there overnight. Then you move it into your main living space or wherever it's going to be that next day. Clean food, 
Dirty Dozen, Clean 15. So that's that's a big part of what we do because maybe someone can't afford all organic. It would be great, but even in general, it's hard to sometimes even find all the organic food that you want. And then the um, the clean water, just a great water filter, you know, is a must. I'd say that's, if I was looking at all of them, I'd say a good water filter is number one because of the amount that you're consuming. And then an air filter, believe it or not, and then the, the food uh, because of the aluminum. I, I think that's a big part of it. W one more fact that I want to give you is that the aluminum, I always thought the greatest amount of aluminum was from aluminum foil, aluminum antiperspirants, and maybe even tap water as well, because there's a lot of aluminum in tap water. Through my research, what I found, and again, I'm studying this research, is that it actually dust particles in the air. Wow. So the average person will consume essentially anywhere from 10 to 50 milligrams of aluminum per day as salicylates, aluminum salicylates. It's bound to dust particles in the air that we inhale. Whoa. And then that moves directly into our bloodstream. Where does it come from? Do we know? So the aluminum still can still come from all of like, let's say this carpet right here or anything like that can track it in. But the aluminum is still in your cleaning materials. Uh, that's essentially where it's off gassing coming from as well. Wow. Yeah, we had an amazing neurologist on the show recently, Dr. Ray Dorsey, who um, whose work you should definitely mm. become, become familiar with if you're not already. He's, you know, board certified neurologist, came through the allopathic medical system. And, you know, he attests to the fact that at the point at which he, he finished medical school, he believed that the, that our food was clean, the air was clean and the water was clean by default. Right. Yes. But he no longer believes that to be the case. And he's, you know, done a lot of really great work making the link between exposures to these sorts of synthetic, uh, industrial pollutants and the, Ideology of conditions like Parkinson's disease, which mm -hmm. is this, like this incredibly mysterious condition, which who's you know the incidence of which has just skyrocketed over the past couple of decades, yes. but it's just uh, but it can get so overwhelming, I think, for your average 100%. person, you know, and that's such a big I feel like problem. And you know, we live in a time now where you know the wellness with the with the 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 the, the wellness industry as big as it is, and and social media, people are getting messages left and right. For, about where they should begin their health journeys, where they should place their focus. So you would say these three big areas, first and foremost, cleaning up your air, cleaning up your water, and making sure that your food is as quote unquote toxin free as possible. Without a doubt. And then just adding your own 12 to 16 hour intermittent fast to that. So whatever works best for your body. And the purpose you, of that is what? So then an intermittent fast, one of the best things is you're just not putting anything else that could be a toxin or well, keep in mind, like everything that we eat causes oxidative stress in the body. So even if it's a healthy food, so all it is a period of rest so that your body can do what it innately knows how to do, which is heal. Hmm. But if you never give it that time and you're always eating, you're always consuming, even if it's the best foods, you're using energy, first of all, which you know, your digestive system uses, there's all sorts of quotes, 25 to 40% of the energy, you know, in a day goes to digestion. So that's why a lot of people, once they start fasting, they automatically feel better. Well, they gave themselves back the energy that they would typically use for digestion. And also, since so many people are eating foods that they're sensitive to, creates a lot of inflammation. And that inflammation then is also draining on the body. So the intermittent fast uh, is, is multifactorial. I would say the least purposeful is for weight loss. Like it's great, it can be a tool for that, but really it's it's a health resource. It allows your body to move out of mTOR and anabolism and growth, which our bodies need, but they need to be equally balanced for you with a period of AMPK and autophagy, which is a period of cleanup in the body. Hmm. So if we have too much growth, that's bad. That could lead to cancer, cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, type two diabetes, but also too catabolic, then what do we have as well? The body breaks down, there's entropy, there's sarcopenia, there's bone loss, and that's hard to get back the older we get. Would you say that we're not already sufficiently fasting when we are sleeping? Well, we are for, let's say, the, for eight hours, right? Yeah. But if we think about the totality of the day, we have 24 hours. And when we look at this thing called rhythmic fasting, which I'm a big believer in. So part of my internships were overseas and I went studying in Sri Lanka, I studied in India, uh, hospitals in China, traditional Chinese medicine, Europe and the United States as well. But one thing that I found that was, that really was across all forms of medicine except Western medicine was this eating during daylight and not during dark. Hmm. And now there's actually clinical research behind that to show, yeah, it makes sense that the digestive system is more awake for lack of a better term when it is light out and it starts to cool down. Like we start to cool down the engine when it's dark. If we rev it back up with blue light or with food, what are we doing? Well, we're turning back on 
cortisol, we're turning back on those stress hormones that shouldn't necessarily be there. And you might say, well, eating is more parasympathetic. I would agree with you. But for most people, what are you doing when you're eating? You're still like, you're, you're talking, you're, you're still doing a million different things. And so I'm a big believer in rhythmic based intermittent fasting. Try to get your last meal in around dark hour, let's say it's five o'clock earlier in the winter, might be a little later in the summer, that's okay. And then go 12 hours without eating. So you have 12 hours to build, 12 hours to then break down. The, uh, little nuances to that though, because when you look at, um, let's say the endomorph body type, mesomorph body type, and ectomorph body type, that's why I don't believe in blanket statements. I really like to look at a personalized based approach. If you're an individual, and let's just say you're 5'8", and you weigh 140 pounds, and then you're another person, I've literally had clients that are 5'8", 205 pounds, just larger humans. I mean, that's it, like bigger bone structures, more mass. And does that person 205 need a longer intermittent fast? Uh, or a shorter one, and the person who's 140 pounds at 5'8", do they need a longer intermittent fast or a shorter one? Now, if you looked at their labs, you could you know, maybe personalize it even more, but just in generality, the person that's 205 is carrying more fuel, right? And they should, they're more prone to higher blood pressure, type two diabetes, more, most endomorphs are. Where the ectomorph, they're more prone to hypoglycemia. They're more prone to catabolism. So for that individual, I'm leaning more 12 to 14 hours. If there's a health issue, maybe I'll go longer. And then the other individual, not only are doing closer to 14 hours, maybe 16, earlier in the night, not so much um, past breakfast where it could spike cortisol, but I'm also looking at maybe one day a week, 24 hour fast, Sunday night to Monday night, that they're doing, doing a water fast or they're doing you know, maybe green juice, something like that that's more catabolic. Wow, super interesting. There's also like an Ayurvedic, because I know you're an expert in Ayurvedic medicine. Does this have any correlate with like the Vata, Pitta, like yes. walk me through a little bit of that. So once I start speaking that language though, people start to like glaze over and they're like, what are you talking about? Yeah. But yes, the vata correlates with the ectomorph, the pitta with the mesomorph, and the kapha with the endomorph. Hmm. It's just, they discovered that 6,000 years ago, we discovered it about 60 years ago. And it was actually done with somatotypes. And the somatotypes was actually done for psychology. Hmm. Because when you look at that, the vata, which is true, is more prone to anxiety. They're more prone to restlessness. The pitta is more prone to, well, we could, we could go down a rabbit hole, but more of like the, the leader um, go after it, but also like kind of push everybody out of their way as they're moving through it. And then the endomorph is usually more chill. They're more relaxed. They're more easygoing. Now, is that across the board? No, because there's something, there's the nurture and there's the nature, right? Mm. And that, that's a big part of it. So we all have a genotype. And in Ayurveda, they call that the prakriti. But we all also have a phenotype. It's who we become. And that's what they call the Vakriti in Ayurveda. So they used all of these terms, which is super fascinating, 6,000 years ago. And we're essentially just rediscovering them today. It's so cool where when modern science catches up with the wisdom of the ages. Yes. Yeah, I love that. And to be able to use both, though, I mean, that's the amazing thing. Yeah, totally. I'm, um, you know, I've always said that my, my own perspective, my own, I guess, philosophy on health and nutrition. It's, I like to be what I call evidence-based, but not evidence-bound. You know, I think yes. it's really important to be informed by scientific data, right? Mm -hmm. Like to always be up on the data and to, and to be able to pivot when new data presents itself that challenges your old um, assumptions or, or beliefs. Mm -hmm. beliefs. But, uh, but there's still so much that we don't know. And then you hear things like the fact that, you know, we'd kind of known about these body type archetypes for millennia yes. and it's now it's just now that science is like really kind of cementing those as you know these quote-unquote evidence-based like body types and the like but um but yeah there's so much i think wisdom to be gleaned from whether it's like traditional chinese medicine or ayurveda it's so i don't cool. i don't think that you yeah you don't so a lot of people are saying well you know i'm science-based i'm uh, and i totally get that but also in science and i love you know science and so the thing is you can find a research study to support anything that you believe in oh yeah right i mean so that's the thing is that we kind of have to be careful here like i could go off and just totally say this, this is the best thing but the other person also says this is the best thing and they they both have an argument and that's why for me i don't like to argue i mean i'm happy to debate but more of in a fun conversational way because i like to look at it from an unbiased perspective because in the end it's not about being the best and your way is the best your diet's the best all these things it's like who are we trying to help 
Hmm. Right. And so as a practitioner, my goal is people come to me for one reason and they mostly have chronic based health conditions. So how do I help this person? And I can't have a dogma. I can have an overall foundational belief system. And for me, it's take the wisdom of ancient based science, Ayurvedic science, which is literally the science of life, right? Traditional Chinese medicine, bioregulatory medicine. But what I want to do is also not forget that we have amazing lab testing and not just blood work. So blood work is fantastic. But my story was for two years, I mean, I was very, very sick from 17 years old. I don't know how deep you want to get into that. But I had the best doctors in the world. I was in Boston, Massachusetts. My PCP was a Harvard graduate and like top of the class. Could you have any position that he want, work with Mount Auburn Hospital, teaching hospital. And I was just, it just lucked that I had him as a PCP. Had no idea that I had autoimmune issues, Addison's disease, type two diabetes, and all these issues. This is going back many years now. This is in the mid nineties. Wow. Because why would a 17 year old who looked like they were in relatively good health have any of these things. So when I ran a regular blood panel, they found that I had, uh, blood sugar was a little off, yes. Um, back then it was more hypoglycemia, which you know typically a doctor, if you have low blood pressure, or you have low blood sugar, that's amazing. Well, it's not necessarily amazing, right? It's like that could be triggered by something like hmm. POTS, right, for the low blood pressure. Or hypoglycemia could be a cortisol-based issue because you're not able to raise aldosterone or cortisol. And so, it took two years to finally figure out that I had all these chronic based conditions. And the only reason they figured it out is because by chance, again, 90s, I didn't have internet back then, uh, I had a neighbor recommend that I go to see this alternative health practitioner. I was super skeptical, but they ran something called the stress moon and metabolism test. It was a salivary cortisol test with a blood spot. And it looked at testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, cortisol throughout the day. And you can't run th cortisol throughout the day without a specialty test. And so, when I got the results back, I wasn't producing cortisol. And so then I take that to my PCP, which kind of was a mistake. And then they said, oh, we should run an Addison's based test. And Addison's is the inability to produce cortisol. And so my, even though we think of cortisol as bad, it's a very powerful anti-inflammatory. And I had debilitating allergies and asthma and uh, reactive hypoglycemia, so type two diabetes. And I lived with that for, almost 10 years. Wow, so you were in a state of chronic inflammation. Chronic inflammation and my body was shut down. So my when I woke up when I was 17 years old, it seemed like it was out of the blue. But I always say there's genetic predisposition, the environment you put your genes in, but there's always typically a triggering event. So looking back on it, I know, yeah, I was super stressed. I was a senior in high school, playing three sports, trying to get a scholarship to be able to go to college, all those things. But I'd also taken antibiotics for three years straight from 14 years old to 17 years old, amoxicillin twice a day. Hmm. And I'd done that for a lot of my childhood, but I did that specifically because a dermatologist put me on it for acne. And so what happened was lack of sleep, stress, getting ready for SATs, all those things, rain barrel overflows, complete chronic illness. My glands were swollen the size of golf balls in my neck, my armpits, my groin, behind my legs. And so when doctors saw me present with that, they knew something was wrong with my immune system, but they had no idea what. And so what I try to share now is that there's always a reason and it's typically you need to go deeper, figure out what's wrong with the gut, figure out what's wrong with the toxicity. Heavy metals is a big one. Could be viral load. There can be a lot of things. But when you go by, and again, I'm a huge advocate of running blood work, but when you go by blood work alone, you're going to miss a disease presentation by a couple of years hmm. because your blood is homeostatic, which means that it's going to do everything in your body possible to rob from different areas in order to maintain homeostasis in your blood. So your blood typically always looks great. Yeah. And also a lot of the blood biomarkers that are typically used are like lagging, typically lagging indicators, right? Like they're, they only raise, uh, they only sound the alarm after you've already been experiencing whatever the symptom is for, um, or the underlying issue yes. is for some time. That and your, your typical medical doctor, and I always give med medical doctors a hard time, but again, they are doing exactly what they are trained to do. They're part of a greater system where you have to see people every 15 minutes and it's a machine. I mean, many of my good friends, best friends are MDs. And so it's not, I'm not giving them a hard time because in acute based medical circumstances, let's say you have blood pressure and it's 190 over 135. You, you should probably be on blood pressure medication until you can stabilize so you don't have a stroke, nothing happens, and then you can bring it down naturally. So there's a time and place for everything in acute based medicine, surgery, all that's wonderful. So I'm not taking anything away from that. but. A medical doctor will see someone at 5.5 for their hemoglobin A1C. 
and the next year it's 5.6, and the year after that it's 5.7. And they could have done something to prevent type 2 diabetes before it starts getting 5.8. Oh, now we're going to go on metformin or insulin or whatever it might be, and now it's over 6.1. And so, yes, it's a lagging indicator like you said, but even afterwards, it's, it can be almost out of range and still nothing is done. Hmm. So unless you're going to a, a doctor with more of a specialty in functional medicine or integrative health, it's difficult to get the care that you really deserve. Hmm. So when it comes to cleaning up one's food environment, I mean, is it not true that a lot of plants harbor heavy metals? I mean, just as a result of in industrial farming today? 100%. Yeah, a lot of, um, especially those that are conventionally farmed. So when we look at what's sprayed on crops, it's not always just herbicides, pesticides, Roundup, all those types of things. It's also what's in the soil, and they're using copper can be used as a, pest, a natural pesticide. So it's really important because one of the labs that we run is called the Minerals and Metals Test, and that's why I, I know why aluminum is so pervasive in the environment. Almost no one comes back with zero aluminum. Hmm. Almost no one. I mean, it can just be a small amount, but every almost everyone has a little bit of aluminum. Well, what we're seeing more and more is copper toxicity. So people are coming back with higher levels of copper. It doesn't make any sense. There can be two reasons. One, over the last few years, um, people have maybe been dealing with a little bit more sickness or virus, whatever it is. That will actually wipe out your zinc. And it's important because everything in the body, and that this is not taught necessarily in school, has an antagonist. So an agonist, antagonist. So zinc and copper are partners calcium magnesium are partners, sodium and potassium are partners. So if you push the lever too hard on one, it will raise the other. Hmm. So for example, if you're depleted in zinc, it will naturally allow copper to accumulate in the body. But if you add more zinc, it'll drop copper down. So it's actually very easy to get copper out of the body uh, in a healthy way by increasing zinc. But the just kind of bring it back full circle, we're seeing a lot more copper specifically sprayed on plants as more of a natural-based pesticide. So I'm careful to eat the vegetables and the fruits that you can't wash it off of. That's one of the biggest things, where it embeds in the skin is a challenging one. And correct me if I'm wrong, copper is, uh, these copper pesticides, these are approved under the organic they are. certification, aren't yes, they? Yes, they are. Yeah. Wow. And zinc, super important for immune function, found primarily where animal source foods animal source foods pumpkin seeds a few others for sure like there are vegan sources but that's why i'm more of a omnivore based approach meaning like every food has tremendous benefits from it and then some people do better with certain foods but what i found over the years is that we need fruits and vegetables. Like we, we need those for sure. When you look at that, like the preponderance of evidence says the more fruits and vegetables you eat, the healthier human you will probably be. But at the same time, a lot of people get bloating. A lot of people get gas from fruits and vegetables. And it's usually for one of four reasons. Parasites, H. pylori, uh, SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, as well as yeast overgrowth. And so the problem is, you know, we eat these things, let's just say, well, it's it's anything fermentable, right? So we eat these things and people start to feel bloated two, three hours later, and they blame it on the food, like the fruit of the vegetable, when most likely they should be peeling back that onion a little bit deeper and say, why am I getting all this fermentation? Why can't I eat normal fruits and vegetables? Whereas like a human, um, if you were, if you had access to all the food in the entire world, it's just easier to pick fruits and vegetables, right? So I'm not saying that you can't eat meat and fish, but these things are absolutely supposed to be part of the human diet, also because they are the only thing that we know of that helps to prevent or give us our best chance of preventing cancer hmm. is brightly colored fruits and vegetables and specifically the polyphenols in those. Interesting. So cool, yeah. I mean, I, I'm a huge advocate of, of like fruit and vegetable consumption. I think it's like fairly irrefutable, but you're right that everybody's different and a lot of people... Yes. You know, there. I think a lot of the, that nuance gets lost on social media. You know, you either have people who are like, you should never eat any vegetables ever. Broccoli is killing you. Right. Or all you should be eating are fruits and vegetables left and right. You know, yes. we should be striving for 150 grams of fiber a day. And I think for most people, especially today, that is just a recipe for GI distress. Huge. And the, you never want to jump from 15 grams of fiber a day to 30 to 50, you're, you're gonna feel it. And so your microbiome adjusts actually very quickly. The enterocytes and the, the biome itself they've shown can change over a two to three day period of time. So very slowly you can just inch these things back up, but it's also meat consumption. So on the other flip side is that a lot of people go vegan because they don't digest meat very well. Okay, well it could be H. pylori, it could just be low stomach acid for particular reasons, it could be high levels of stress. So it's saying, okay, well what type of meat are you eating? 
Um, cause you might not do well with a really high fat meat. Okay. Well, let's start with the, a leaner meat, see how you do there. And let's also understand that meat is a little harder to break down. So maybe we give you a little digestive enzymes with that. Uh, we could even do bitters. We could do a little bit of apple cider vinegar. We could help with that process. Ginger tea is another great one, but sometimes it's just volume. So you start with eating just a small handful and then you work your way up because like I said, there's amazing nutrients. Yes, you can get them from plants, but some nutrients are just easier to get from meat. And so like, just have some meat, have some vegetables. And one of the signs that I like overall is just general metabolic and physical flexibility. So back when I was at, when I was really sick, I couldn't miss a night's sleep. If I missed a night's sleep, glands are swollen, immune system shutting down. Like I was a mess. I couldn't do an overnight flight because I would just, I would be done. And so what I've seen now as, you know, I'm, I'm now in my mid forties, getting closer to 50 is like, I'm stronger in terms of metabolic flexibility than ever. I can go a day without eating. And like, that's really important that you get your body there, but you don't just start there. You work that up and there's also no race. On social media, it seems like there's a race to get somewhere. And if we look at it now, I believe humans, uh, and this is this is not just a hypothesis. Men and women die somewhere between the age of typically 74 to 77. But they die for cardiovascular reasons, high blood pressure and stroke, type 2 diabetes complications, cancer, and Alzheimer's. After that, nobody talks about there's almost no real cause of death. Okay, so there's COPD and emphysema. Well, if you don't smoke or inhale chemical irritants, you're almost not going to get those. After that, it's accidents. It's literally motorcycles and falling off your roof. Now, like that's legitimate. And so what do we what do we really and then there's kidney based issues, but they don't say the kidney based issues are really based on high blood pressure and type two diabetes. Mm. So if you don't die from one of those five causes, and, and all of them are very preventable, and you can catch them early. The only one that's difficult to treat right now is cancer, if it's not caught in stage one or stage two, like I'm, not, I'm always, you know, gonna be honest, it's hard in stage four to treat to successfully treat cancer, but we can, you know, but it's it's going to get easier. Alzheimer's can be found, and I know you know this, 20 to 30 years early. So if you're doing a full body MRI with a brain scan, or you're doing one on Dr. Amons or something like that, you're gonna be able to see the first signs. You can start to then use the MEN protocol and other protocols to be able to then reverse Alzheimer's. Like I'm very passionate about that because um, as someone in my family who has Alzheimer's and APOE genotype, we know if we're more prone to it. But you don't have to live in worry. You can literally just run one lab a year and be like, all right, am I good or am I good? Okay, I'm good. I'm good. I get now 12 months to breathe and I'll do it again. But doing the things that you need to do to get there. So all that to say, if you don't get one of those five, you're almost guaranteed to live another 10 to 12 years. Wow. So they found that people who make it to 82 free of those things can live easily to 92. And now with all of the advancements we have going on actually in medicine, likely, I don't know that we're going to get to 150. There could be a major breakthrough, just like, you know, the large language models are now. Like you can have a big breakthrough. But right now, safe to say most of us can get to about 100, a little over 100 for sure. By minimizing our risk for these, the, the, the big non-communicable The conditions. big five. Yes. The big five. What's your take on, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of people now are talking about longevity through the lens of a, I guess you could say a muscle forward approach, you know, a mm. muscle to quote uh, our friend Gabrielle Lyon, a muscle centric approach yes. to uh, healthy aging and longevity, um, which I think necessitates if we are optimizing our diets and our lifestyles for muscle tends to necessitate a higher protein diet. And the best quality protein tends to be animal source protein. And, um, and so, yeah, what's your, what's your, what's your general take on that? So, and Gabrielle's amazing. Peter Tia is amazing. Like I love them both. They're fantastic. But I also read all of the work of, um, David Sinclair, uh, Walter Longo, et cetera. And they're more low protein, basically vegan, more plant-based. So you have two opposing views, but both people want the same thing and both are right. So then it comes down to personalizing what works best for you. So I say this, should a person, average American, that's sedentary, doesn't even get more, the average steps in the United States is about low 3,000, it's like 3,500. That's what we find in our practice. We track everything. So left to your own devices, about 3,500 steps per day. I've seen it myself. You know, I research, I, I you know, my daughters make fun of me, but um, I read, I write, I research, I record. That's what I do. And so I'm at my desk the majority of the day. I've got a walking treadmill, all those things, but I have to be conscious of walking because if not, yeah, I get 30, you know, 3,500 steps a day as well. So let's say you're not weight training, you're not doing cardio aerobic base, you're not doing your zone two, you're not doing all of these things. Should you be eating one pound per body weight? I don't believe so. 
because you're not metabolically active enough. There's no real cell, there's no muscle turnover to the same degree. So those individuals, I believe are gonna be more, I, again, would love to see more research behind this. You're sedentary, you're more of an anabolic state, there's no catabolism, there's no breakdown, and you're increasing then mTOR. And you're increasing mTOR, not at one or two meals, but actually breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So you're increasing that anabolic state. I worry that people between the ages of 35 and 65 may be more prone than to cancer. It's the one that I'm most worried about because it's the hardest one to fix. So I'm always trying to mitigate risk for that. So what I do is when I work with athletes, I work with people more, uh, more active or more on the ectomorph side, ectomorph to pitta side. So we'll kind of go in between vata pitta. They're getting more protein. And then for the people that are larger body types and that uh, might be more prone to anabolism and they're a little less active, I'm not going as high. However, I fall somewhere in the middle. And so I'm, I'm almost like, you know, I would say on the middle of the fence. And the reason is if I had to err one side, yes, this is most likely to you less of a chance for cancer because you're keeping IGF-1 levels low, you're keeping mTOR levels low, you're keeping AMPK high, you're keeping autophagy high. But you also then, and I know it myself because I lean there, I'll become catabolic, I'll become tired, I'll become weak. So I can't go too low in my protein. Like I actually need some meat and fish. I don't need as much as I used to, but that's where I find best for me. So I try to customize that for, for all of our individuals. I don't know if it exactly answered your question because the truth is, I don't know that we have an exact answer. Yeah. And so I try to, I try to that, that is one big issue that I'm always looking deeper into. And so all I try to do is base it on the individual. The harder you train, the more tissue breakdown, the more protein you need. I'll give one more caveat though. If you are hypocaloric, you can absolutely increase your protein because you're always in a state of catabolism essentially. And so that makes sense to me. And for, I had, a, I had a, before I became a doctor of naturopathy, I was a personal trainer and nutritionist. And so right up, we, we had two clinics in Boston um, and one of those was just dedicated actually to uh, fitness and nutrition. And so that's what we did. Like we literally specialized in personal training. And what it was, was leans and greens, right? So it was lean protein and vegetables. And you know what? It works phenomenally well to transform their body. And like nothing else that I've ever seen works better than it. Because if there was something better, bodybuilders would do something different, mm -hmm. right? Like they, they know how to transform their bodies. So for those individuals, hypocaloric, weight training with me three times a week, and I wanted them to do either hill walks or, or 10,000 steps a day, not even a lot of cardio. Because again, we're trying to simplify 80, 20. They had high protein. They had one pound per uh, one pound of protein Per pound of body weight, and it works phenomenally. One well. gram of protein. Sorry, one, one gram of protein. Yeah. Yes, that would be. <laughs> that amazing. sounds like a challenge. I'd be willing to take, but that. It, <laughs> yes. That doesn't um, seem like a lot. And and it works, and it, it does work well. So for body transformation, no doubt about it. Uh, but I, I want to put some caution to that, just for long term. Um, yeah. Health. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's an interesting interesting take for sure. I don't know if I would put my stock in the dietary recommend re recommendations per se of David Sinclair and Walter Longo, even though they're, they're both brilliant scientists. Not, I'm not trying to take anything away from the science that they've published, but, um, but from a dietary standpoint, I feel like there's really no, I can't think of any downside to, cons to quote unquote over consuming protein, in part because I think it's so difficult to over consume protein because it's so satiating. So yes. for that anti-obesogenic effect alone, that it, you know, when you, when you, tend to focus on protein in your diet. It tends to, tends to make you less inclined to overconsume the other stuff, which is energy by and large. Yes. Which, you know, it's hard to argue that anybody in the Western world is in a state of energy uh, deficit, you yes. know? Well, and I agree with that too, because if we think about it, you know, 70% of all adults want to or could lose weight, right? So that that's super important when right. we look at that. and. We want people to feel satiated or they are going to overeat. And we do want people that have energy and we do need all those amino acids. So it's not like I'm fighting against that, but as a practitioner, you know, I have this, everybody obviously has this oath, but you just, you want to do right by your patients or your clients. And so you're always trying to weigh that. Now, the in the grand scheme of things, when you look at it, if you're on a 2000 calorie a day diet, you can still eat a hundred grams of protein, which you know, David Sinclair, Walter Longo would say is way too much. And maybe, again, Gabrielle's work is amazing. Um, Peter's work's amazing. They might say it's too little for like 150 pound maybe individual. But 100 grams of protein is still pretty good. And that's still at 20% of their macros. 
which when you look at a lot of people feel, once you go above 20%, you might be pushing mTOR a little bit. But again, if you're in a hypocaloric state and you're doing 12 to 16 hours of intermittent fasting, I think all that levels out. I really do. Yeah. When it comes to, um, when it comes to, uh, protein sources, your favorite protein sources, what are, what are your typical go, go to's for plant-based proteins? I like chickpeas. I like, uh, cannellini beans. Um, so I'm, I'm big on those. They're pretty easy to digest. So a lot of people, and I like the sprouted one. So Jovial makes like a new sprouted one, which is like hmm. easy, comes right out. It's in a glass container rather than a can as well. Uh, so black beans are, are okay, but they can be sometimes hard to digest for individuals. I also like hemp hearts, a um, big one of that. So just basically sprouted hemp seeds. And then for animal-based proteins, um, all of them. So you're, you're, I, I actually go more towards like elk and bison, but I have no problem with grass-fed, grass-finished meat, um, pastured chicken. Um, I eat fish three to four times a week, and I like the smaller fish whenever possible, plus the wild salmon. So all of the lowest mercury fish, because I'm always trying to reduce mercury. For me, I had very high levels of mercury all through college, and I didn't know it. So I was just a poor college student. Every single night, I was trying to put on muscle. I was going to the gym. I, that's what I love to do because I couldn't fix my internal body. So I just try to like take it out of my outside body, right? And so yeah. that was a big thing for me. And, and it was actually like my saving grace. Like that saved me mentally when I was in a really bad spot that at least I could work out in the gym. Like that was nice. And so um, after regular dinner, we'd go and I'd put a can of tuna on some microwavable rice, like literally in one of those bags, like that's how bad it was. Again, this is like the late 90s. And then olive oil on top. And I'm sure it was the cheapest, worst olive oil out there. <laughs> and so uh, a year or two later, I had my uh, minerals metals test done. They looked at my hair and it was super high in mercury. And my doctor said, are you eating a lot of fish? And I said, yeah, every night. He's like, is it tuna? I was like, yeah, every night. And so what I realized is like, you can have some tuna, but probably once a month, maybe twice a month maximum. So there's five fish, sardines, uh, mackerel, anchovies, um, wild salmon, and wild trout that are all high in omega-3s. They help to reduce the arachidonic acid. And some arachidonic acid is actually really important, but too much leads to a lot of prostaglandins, uh, throboxanes, leukotrienes, things that you don't want creating inflammation in your body. So these omega-3s help to balance that. So I'm always preaching that in my practice, a uh, big advocate of all of those, but they also help to balance meat, which most people aren't getting great quality meat. Mm. So it's very high in omega-6s, uh, which means it's very high in inflammation. Hmm. Yeah, I definitely think that there's an argument to be made for leaner uh, red meat. Um, leaner, leaner meat in general these days because... I mean, actually, you look across the board, even to farmed fish, mm -hmm. to factory farmed chicken, to industrially produced beef, it's, they're way fattier animals than their wild counterparts. Yes. A modern cow is, I mean, first of all, few people realize this, but the cow is a domesticated human creation. Like we've made cows. Cows don't exist in the wild. They are hybrid. Yes. They're, yeah. They're, yeah. And, they're, and, they're, and they're incredibly fatty. And especially you take a grain, you take a grain finished cow and it's way fattier even than its grass fed, grass finished counterpart. Tastes completely different. Yeah. yeah. Even just finished. Yeah. yeah. And don't get me wrong. I mean, they taste, I think they taste delicious. Like 90%, 99% of the time when you're eating beef in a restaurant, I mean, it's, it's grain fed, right? Yes. So it's, it's, I mean, it is super tasty, but I definitely think like, you know, that, that from a, a health standpoint, it makes a lot more sense with regard to our physiology from a, for, th particularly through an evolutionary lens that leaner cuts would be more biologically appropriate. I think so. And it's very easy to overconsume fat. So unlike protein, which you talked about, it's very satiating. Fat isn't really that satiating. Um, you can, cons so if I just make, um, so for example, my lunch is typically plant-based. My dinner is going to be meat or fish. And so I'll take almost a cup of, um, let's just say, uh, sprouted chickpeas, garbanzo beans. And I'll put three color, uh, three cups of colorful vegetables, typically broccoli, cauliflower, some rainbow carrots. And then I'll add maybe a purple potato or I'll add some rice, whatever it might be. I can put on five tablespoons of olive oil, no problem. Yeah. Right? Like I don't, but it's very easy to do that. And it doesn't make me more full or less full. That's 600 that. calories right there. Ex exactly. Of pure fat. <laughs> of pure fat. And you might say, well, it's really healthy, three, six, and nines, but it's still an enormous amount of fat. And I can do that at every meal. So I agree with you. I also, when I was overseas, when I was in India, the cows, you can see their ribs. And almost like if you have an animal, you, you want to be able to see the animals, like if you have a dog, right? You should be able to see the dog's waist. That's a healthy sign for a dog. I mean, humans as well. I think humans should have, you know, there's varying sizes, but should have a waist. And so it's just a sign that that animal is healthier. Plus what we spoke about earlier, 
the more fat something has, the more toxins it accumulates. It, or just it's a storage house for those things. So you have to be careful because if you're going to add a, eat a fatty cut like a uh, ribeye, which can be delicious, if you're having that ribeye at a restaurant, be careful because like you said, it's grain uh, fed and grain finished. So what I would say is if I'm at a restaurant and I'm eating meat, because I do, you know, if I'm at a restaurant, um, I might get the filet or I might get something a little bit leaner than the ribeye. And if I'm at home, I'll cook a ribeye mm. and, and I'll just enjoy it there. I don't, you know, eat all the fat. But at the same time, I also say to people, I, I like to follow the 90% rule. So when I go out, I'm gonna enjoy myself. Like I will have whatever I like. I don't usually eat gluten, but when I go out, grew up in an Italian and Portuguese family, mm -hmm. I'm having some pasta and I'm having some bread and I'm not gonna feel bad about it. But then back on my diet and just like that to me feels like good balance. Mm. Everybody love, has their own, but that's yeah, what I have. I agree. And I love Portuguese food, by the way. That's great. I have a bacalao recipe in my, uh, in my cookbook. It's I just 10. had it like last month. It's fantastic. You did 10 out of 10. It's amazing. Yeah, I totally agree. When I go to, uh, when I'm out at restaurants, I 90, 95% of the time these days, I'm getting like the filet mignon. And I, I changed. I used to be a big like ribeye guy out in restaurants. But then I kind of had the realization that, you know, ribeyes vary ribeye to ribeye. And essentially, I mean, you know, you eat like a 14 to 16 ounce ribeye, which I could easily do. Mm -hmm. And those things could harbor... 2,000 calories just in, in one steak. And and when you look at it, the reason why they're in more of like a, a keto-based diet is because they have an enormous amount of fat. Yeah. And so when you look at that, you say, yeah, this is, um, am I eating protein or am I eating fat? With a ribeye, you can make the argument that it's a fatty food, not a high protein food. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, but- It's kind of like the bacon of steaks. It, it is. And that's why people love it. I love it. I right? do love it. Yeah. Yeah. But when traveling now these days, I mean, yeah, I go for the fillets and I feel so good afterwards because it's so lean and it's not fat free. It's not a fat free piece of meat. No. Like we're not being, this isn't like a fat phobic um dietary choice I'm making. It's that, you know, it's got a, more than enough fat, particularly if it's coming from a, a grass fed grain finished industrial cow, but the protein is pristine. It's mostly going to be protein by calories as opposed to a ribeye where you're getting mostly fat by calories. Uh, I found too, you know, if I have a, a big meal and that big ribeye, you do, your sleep suffers a little bit as well. I'm mm. sure you track your sleep because it takes so much energy and for so long to break that down. So if you if you use a continuous glucose monitor or you use a whoop strap or a ring or whatever it might be, you'll actually see your heart rate doesn't drop until like three in the morning. Like if you go to bed at let's say 10, it drops later. And you'll see that your heart rate stays a little bit higher. If you're usually in let's say the, the low to mid 50s, it might be in the low 60s. And your heart rate variability is five or 10 points less. That is because of the strain on your digestive system. Because when we, when we stop eating, let's say at, you go out on the weekend, I don't know what time you go, but let's just say you stop eating at eight o'clock. Um, you don't start fasting at 8, 8 1 p.m., right? You start fasting truly when that is moved through, not the whole digestive system, but at least through your stomach and maybe duodenum, where a lot of that main work is being done. So I always like to, to share that with people because if you have gut issues as well, uh, this could exacerbate that and it could be inflammatory. And the more saturated fat you take in, and again, I'm not anti-saturated fat, but when you have gut issues, it increases the lipopolysaccharides. It's a shuttle for the bacteria or potential pathogens out of that gut permeability. So if you do have any leaky gut, higher saturated fats can create more inflammation. And again, saturated fats aren't demonized, they're not bad, but again, we're always talking about for whom. Right? And for some individuals, it can be detrimental. Yeah, I wonder, because I, I, I'm familiar with the studies that you're talking about where they've used like heavy cream or coconut oil and they've they've seen that that phenomena whereby these fats can like ferry essentially That's lipopolysaccharide right. into circulation, which is this this highly inflammatory compound. But I wonder if that would be if that would also occur in the context of a of a mixed meal, you know, a meal with polyphenols and fiber and like a whole food saturated fat source as opposed to these like isolated, you know fats or butters or whatever oils that they that they were using in those studies. What would my, what would be one of those um whole foods? Like what do you what do you think? Well, a piece of meat. You yeah, know. you don't think it would be the same? I don't know. Yeah. No, I'd know. like to see that as well. I yeah. mean, I'm, these things make me curious. Like I actually these things should be tested. And it's also why I'm not adamant in what I say besides foundational based. Well, nutrition. I will say I will say this to that to that question um that red meat hasn't been found to be inflammatory. Like a pro, like there are randomized controlled trials that look at, the one that I'm thinking of was funded by the Beef Checkoff Institute, but that doesn't invalidate a study, you know. Mm -hmm. um, did, it was a meta-analysis meta of randomized controlled trials that looked at inflammatory, inflammatory, you know, cytokines in relation to 
beef feeding um, in these like RCTs and they found no, no significant inflammatory effect. Um, so I don't know. I don't know. But, uh, but yeah, I guess everybody's different and like people's level, you know, the varying levels of gut dysbiosis, you know, on an individual basis is obviously something to consider. And I think sometimes it goes back to quantity. Like I really, like what can your body handle? Everybody has a, a tipping point or a breaking point. And so I would just say, uh, if you're talking about like a 240 pound linebacker, like they're good, I mean, and they're, they're working out for three, four hours a day. They're gonna be able to just consume that and assimilate it. Protein synthesis is gonna be high. It's just radically different from the average individual that's, you know, 20, 30 pounds overweight and mm. their, their body's already inflamed. So when you take in something uh, that is not grass fed, because when we look at um, animal based meat too, you can clearly see that a lot of the leaner cuts are also less inflammatory though, or even healthier. And I would just say, since all the data is not in, we don't necessarily know everything. If we had to err on the side of caution, I would eat an omnivore-based diet. I would include some of the leaner meats. You can include fatty meats as well. Um, and I just think that you're, I would say you're, you're betting your life on what you eat. So let's just take a uh, I don't, not, not just not at one side or the other, more conservative-based approach. Yeah, well, I'm definitely on the side of, of food quality being a, a primary concern with the caveat that you don't have to be perfect. That's right. Um, I do like the 80-20 mm -hmm. per perspective because, um, you know, I, like in my, my own personal rule, and, I'm, and it sounds like you're similar, is that like what I bring into my house is the best that I can afford, right? So it's going to be the grass-fed, grass-finished mm -hmm. beef. It's going to be the organic fruits and vegetables, um, you know, excluding like avocados and bananas and things like that, where you don't eat the skin or the peel. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, and in my house, I drink like water, spring water from glass now, which I, which I'm so grateful that I can afford and that I, and that I do. But when I'm out, you know, if I'm traveling, if I'm at the airport, yeah, I'll buy a bottle of water in plastic and, uh, I'll eat in restaurants and I eat vegetable fruit, you know, produce that, uh, that is not necessarily organic and beef that comes from who knows where, sure. you know, we can't let perfect be the enemy of the good, but I do like the idea of, you know, educating people around these important nuances with regard to quality, because um, if there's anything that the food system has done over the past few decades, it's it's really you know led to the decline of our food quality and all the subsequent like nutritional density that that used to exist in uh, in the food supply. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, that's the thing is like it's it's so easy to fall off of your diet when you're outside of your house control what you can control in your house when you're able to, and you just make the best choices possible. Like nobody's gonna be perfect. And also what I could afford now is radically different from what I could afford 10 years ago and 10 years before that. So in general, I'm always just trying to up level my life a little bit at a time. And I think most people should do the same when we're talking about, you know, heavy metals. Okay. We don't want to be cooking on aluminum pans with aluminum spatulas, but you can't replace all of your pans right at once. So what's the one that you cook on the most? Let's replace that first. Let's use a bamboo spatula or silicone based spatula. And let's just, you know, every few months or every year, let's get a new one. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. Are there any, any specific foods that um, are particularly helpful with regard to assisting your body better de detoxify itself? The biggest one, so our body has the phase one, which we talked about in phase two. So phase one is, let's just call it most of your vitamins and most of your B vitamins. But phase two are your sulfur-based amino acids. And most people are not getting enough sulfur-based amino acids. They're, they're just not, because they're not eating a lot of cruciferous-based vegetables. It's one of the easiest places to get them. I think, as we were talking about earlier, you have to ease them into your diet. Some people do fine with, let's say, broccoli. They do fine with asparagus, uh, maybe cauliflower, but not with uh, bok choy or not with Brussels sprouts, right? Like I do great for pretty much all vegetables except Brussels sprouts. For whatever reason, me and Brussels sprouts don't mix. <laughs> and so you just, you stay away from the ones that you don't necessarily digest that well. For whatever reason, it's just that dense cabbage is not necessarily gonna work for me. But those vegetables, two to three cups per day, they contain sulforaphane. And it's one of the most powerful sulfur-based amino acids that you can put in your body for natural detoxification. So anybody who doesn't want to use supplementation or whatever it is, two to three cups per day of cruciferous vegetables, don't, I, I prefer, again, there are different ways of doing this. I prefer not to cook an oil, mm. but then I add the oil afterwards. So I add olive oil on top, a little sea salt, and that fat actually helps with some of that absorption as well. Wow. And the vegetables, do you have to eat them? I mean, do you lose anything in the, in the cooking process? Do you eat them raw? What's your favorite way to consume them? I, I never eat raw cruciferous vegetables. I think they're really hard to digest. And also, uh, 
the cooking helps to bring out and actually release some of this sulforaphane, which they've shown to be great for the nervous system, for the brain, for essentially the, the liver, the kidneys, et cetera. But, and, and believe it or not, it's the act of chewing by breaking down that cellular structure that begins to release all of this as well. So I like to make them easy to digest. We typically bake them instead of uh, fry them or anything like that. Interesting. In yeah. And you bake them dry or you bake them with like a little bit of olive Literally oil? Literally bake them dry. Wow. Yeah. yeah, I do. We do rainbow carrots, yucca, everything we bake dry. And then put them in a ceramic bowl or whatever you like to do. Little sea salt, your favorite sea salt. Uh, we typically use Redmond's. Um, Celtic sea salt is great, all of those. But um, then put the olive oil in there, toss it like that, put in rosemary, put in whatever you like. It's phenomenal. Wow. In your book, which is phenomenal, by the way, by the way people should definitely... Um, Pick, pick it up. You say that many people are chronically dehydrated. How how does that appear to be the case? And then how do we rectify that? Well, when I say chronically dehydrated, I mean not at a blood plasma level. I mean at actually at a tissue level. Hmm. So when we look at how does the body, you know, really function, it's essentially we we always think about vitamins, but really it's minerals which are essentially electricity in the body and the cell membrane itself, which is, yes, it's a bilipid membrane with fat, but it is essentially an osmotic process of moving sodium, keeping the sodium out of the cell, keeping the potassium in the cell, and without proper hydration, meaning not um, like reverse osmosis water is great, but you want to add some minerals back in. And you want your water, I don't know if they have to go through a structuring process, to actually be absorbable. And so what we're looking at now is that I'm not against sodium, but the majority of Americans are very high in sodium and very low in potassium. Mm. And their body's not able to absorb the water in the same way at a tissue-based level. So they, and I've, I've just, we've seen over a quarter million people in our practice, now well over 300,000. We've run over half a million labs. And so when people come in, and I say, how many glasses of water are you drinking per day? And the average is like two to three. Like, oh, when I have a meal, I have that because I have coffee in the morning. And it's not that coffee is dehydrating, but it's not hydrating. You know, if you're, they, they have a great, this study has been out now for 30 years. But if you've been drinking coffee habitually every single day, coffee doesn't dehydrate you. It just doesn't hydrate you, right? And so it's just like water in, water doesn't even necessarily come out. <laughs> but when you're drinking regular water, people are having to urinate. Like they're having to pee all the time. And that's because their body's not able to absorb it. They don't have proper levels of magnesium. They don't have proper levels of potassium. So at a tissue-based level, they can't actually draw that in. So what does it look like? Fatigue, brain fog, migraines, dry skin, dry hair, dry nails. Their, their tissues are literally dehydrated. Wow. Are you a fan of, do you reverse osmosis purify your water? I do now. Yes. So I didn't until about a year and a half ago. I used a regular water filter or I bought spring water, but I was also sometimes using glass, sometimes using plastic. And I said, you know what? And even though it was like Icelandic water, like good water, I said, I'm not using plastic anymore. Again, just like you said, in my house, no more plastic. And so that, that's what we did. And so um, we have glass bottles of Mountain Valley and San Pellegrino, which I really like, <clears throat> and Mountain Valley still, and then San Pellegrino sparkling. But I got an, a reverse osmosis filter that's on the countertop. And um, if we end up staying in our place, I'll get a whole house filter so that I don't have to have a separate one in my shower and the bathtub and all those things. Yeah. yeah. But it's been very helpful. Yeah. I was using a um, an AquaTrue reverse osmosis purifier for a long time until I uh, realized I had the resources to just get delivery, like spring water in glass, Mountain Valley to my house. And, mm -hmm. uh, and it's been like amazing. I just, I love it. And spring water already has minerals in it, if I recall correctly. They're like, there's a certain amount of calcium, magnesium, but I'll actually even go a step further. And um, when I get like a fresh bottle before I install it in the in the dispenser, I'll put um, a couple of squirts of like a trace mineral yeah. um, solution into it just to just to jack up the mineral content even further. Every So spring water is hands down. It, that's what nature gave us. It's the best water out there, but just not everybody can get access to mm. it. So if you can in a glass bottle, like they actually have delivery services of the five gallon glass jugs now that you can put right on. I don't know if that's what you get. Yeah, that's what I get. Oh, you get what you get? That's yeah. fantastic. So they don't have that in my area, but um, I think it's that's the best thing. And they're recyclable that people, and all that. Yeah, like people don't need to do that. It's a, it's, it is definitely a very privileged thing that I do and I, you know, but I've, I've worked hard and I'm very proud that I get to do it and it tastes great and I give it to my cat. My cat only drinks spring water. But, um, but yeah, it's amazing. But before that, for years, I was using the, the AquaTrue mm -hmm. um, purifier. And then I was adding like the, tr that's actually why I have the trace minerals. I had them in my house because you can, you buy a bottle and they last forever. Forever. Yeah. yeah. And so I was using it for, for the water that went through the purifier. But now I just put it, I just add it to my 
to my Mountain Valley bottles. You know what else I do, which is really interesting? I'd love to hear your take on this, but um, I don't use iodized salt. So I have this like iodine supplement that comes mm-hmm. in a little dropper bottle and I'll actually put like a few drops of, of iodine into my spring water as well. Cause it has mm-hmm. like a barely perceptible taste. You don't, you don't taste it essentially. And it ensures that every time I drink water from my, um, from my, from, from the dispenser, I'm getting, I'm getting a significant amount of iodine, like in my, in my drinking water. And I see nothing wrong with that. But what I would do is I would run a, like a stress mood metabolism type test, which looks at your thyroid and just make sure that your TSH isn't below a 0.5. Mm. So you're not pushing the thyroid too much. Yeah. But now keep in mind, the majority of people in the world are deficient in iodine. That's why they add iodine to salt, right? Yeah. I mean, because like that's a deficiency. So unless you're eating sea vegetables or like th- things like that, you're not getting the iodine. But the other amazing, and I, I think it's a great idea. The other great thing about iodine though, is that it's a water purifier. So it is yes. Oh, what, so chlorine and or iodine are water purifiers, and so uh, if you were out and you were just getting spring water, you can add iodine to it to help kill bacteria. Whoa. Yeah, in the in the water. Well, I guess like in so. surgery, they rub iodine as a disinfectant. Right? Antiseptic. Antiseptic. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Wow, super cool. Yeah, I put like four drops, and if I recall correctly, which like again in four drops of iodine in a five gallon bottle, you don't taste it. Oh, I thought you meant per. Yeah, yeah. That's that's not that's nothing. No, yeah, no, 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 that's not too bad at but all. But four drops of this iodine supplement that I use. It's like, I don't know, 1,500% of your daily needs. And so I did the math. A five-gallon bottle lasts mm-hmm. me typically two weeks because I get the delivery every two weeks. And so conceivably, I'm getting about 100% of my RDA for vi- for iodine mm-hmm. on a daily basis just by drinking water. So it's like checking off my... For yeah. sure. Just no, checking off that box. It's, it's powerful. So we, we, can, we can look at that on labs and actually see. One thing I would say is... Um, because people can get out of control with their water now, and, and I absolutely do that. So I'm, I'm happy to say. But you know, people spend their money in just different ways, and I, I very much enjoy the the healthy biohacking and all that. But I do reverse osmosis, and I have this copper container. So copper is a natural antimicrobial, antifungal, and it stores the water. Because you know what, that AquaTrue, it's it's tiny, right? It's like three fourths of a gallon, or maybe that's like a liter and a half, and then. I have a water spinner that basically just creates a vortex that I then add the trace minerals to. Hmm. And so it just, you know, it brings those minerals into the water. And uh, my daughter, you know, who jokes around, she's like, the water just tastes more wet out of hmm. that. I'm like, yeah, may- maybe it does. And um, all of these little things, though, what are we trying to do? Just bring it back to spring water. That's all we did, right? We took it out of the tap. We um, added the iodine or whatever it might be. We spun it to have be running spring water. And now we're back to spring water. So when in doubt, if you can get what's closest to nature, and spring water if possible. You're a fan of drinking a lemon, warm lemon water first thing in the morning. What are the benefits of that? Yeah, lemon water. And if the person runs a little bit, let's say um, a lot of people that I work with my practice, a little lightheaded, a little weak, a little brain fog, pinch of sea salt as well. So lemon provides you, it has some sodium, but it provides you with a lot of potassium. And the sea salt is the sodium. So I call that essentially a natural Gatorade. And so what you're doing is you are now better able to absorb that water coming in dry from eight hours. It's usually not eight hours, like eight hours in bed, but most people don't drink for two to three hours before bed any water because they don't want to wake up to urinate. So think about it. It's like it might have been 12 hours from the last time you consumed anything. And so the sodium and the potassium helps you to absorb it that much better. It's just basically electrolytes. Hmm. Yeah, the, the hot water does help with the digestive system. They have shown, but that wouldn't be the only reason I use it. Yeah. I drink water like up until the point I go to bed. I wake up every single night to pee, but I like drinking water at night. I see nothing wrong with that as long as it does not throw off your sleep. So if you're tracking your sleep and you have no issues getting the 90 minutes deep sleep and two plus hours REM, there's no issue. Hmm. Dude, well, thanks for coming in. This was, uh, we covered a lot of, a lot of ground, super important stuff. Um, and I'd love to leave room for a round two because, yeah, I feel like you've got a lot to offer and um, just a wealth of knowledge. And we didn't even get into like too deeply the Ayurvedic stuff and the China, the traditional Chinese medicine stuff, which I think is a fascinating realm that I would love to explore more deeply. That's Anytime. Something. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, of course. Well, I've got one last question for you. But before we get to that, where can people put I know you put out a ton of content on social media. Where can people find you online, on social media? I know you have a podcast as well. Yes. Um, and where can they pick up your book? So stephencabral.com and it's Stephen with the PH. 
That is where I podcast the Cabral concept is, the book is The Rain Barrel Effect, and at-home lab testing, which we kind of talked about today, to find out your omega-3 levels, to find out your levels of aluminum, iodine, whatever it might be, all that's at stephencabral.com. Love it. Well, the last question I got to ask everybody on the show, what does living a genius life mean to you? I think being able to find that balance, I really do. It's like I, I try to live my life healthily, but when there is a moment that's just for enjoyment, whether it's with food or it's even having to drink every once in a while, whatever it is, no guilt, no shame, just enjoying the moment. Love that. Hey, if you like that video, you need to check out this one here and I'll see you there.